Thomas Jefferson. Born in Virginia in 1743. His family lived on a plantation, had sizable holdings of rich tobacco lands and slaves. After college, Jefferson practiced law in colonial Williamsburg, but it was a revolutionary era and he was at the forefront of the movement to establish basic rights for Americans. Jefferson scholar Merrill Peterson. Well, I think that he, uh, he grew up with a sense of responsibility, civic responsibility, that undoubtedly came out of that tradition of aristocratic planter leadership in the colony of Virginia. Fury against the British crown was rising. While serving in the House of Burgesses, Jefferson wrote what many consider to be the strongest position against the British rule in the colonies. So when the Continental Congress met, the Founding Fathers called upon Jefferson to write the Declaration of Independence. He wrote better than anybody else. Jefferson tried to talk Adams into drafting the Declaration. He said, oh, you write ten times better than I do. And Jefferson had uh, carved out a niche for himself in the Continental Congress as a draftsman of state papers. Jefferson wrote for three long weeks through the sweltering summer heat. On July 4th, 1776, the Declaration of Independence was read in front of what is today Independence Hall in Philadelphia. Though he was only 33, Jefferson had created the document that would serve as the guiding force for the new American government, a clear and powerful expression of basic human rights. After serving as governor of Virginia, a brief turn in Congress, and as minister to France, Jefferson returned home in 1789 to become Secretary of State under George Washington. Jefferson was constantly at odds with Alexander Hamilton and John Adams, other members of the cabinet. They had very different ideas about the role of Republican government under the Constitution. Finally, Jefferson resigned but his political aspirations were still unfulfilled. In 1796, he ran for president against Adams and lost, and ended up vice president of the United States at the age of 53. Four years later, Jefferson won the presidency, and later called the victory the Revolution of 1800. It represented a change of government and party in power through the electoral process. One of the first things he did as president was to erase the restrictive legislation of the Adams era, like the Alien and Sedition Acts. All were struck down. In a very tense uh, diplomatic drama that was played out between 1801 and 1803, uh, Jefferson played his cards just right, uh, and his, his, his cards of diplomacy just right. In 1802, Napoleon was attempting to re-establish a major French presence on the North American continent, and it had Americans worried. Jefferson was determined to stop French interference and protect American trade on the Mississippi. At the same time, Napoleon needed money for a war he intended to wage against Britain. Remarkably, he decided to sell all of the Louisiana Territory for $15 million. The purchase was the largest peaceful transfer of territory in history, doubling the size of the United States with over 830,000 square miles of land at three cents an acre. I think the Louisiana Purchase was unquestionably the greatest achievements of Jefferson's presidency. Another spectacular success of the era was Jefferson's plan for an expedition across the continent. Captain Meriwether Lewis and Lieutenant William Clark set out in the spring of 1804 from St. Louis. The commercial goal of the expedition was to chart a continuous line of navigation from the Missouri River all the way to the west coast. In this regard, the trip failed. The explorers ran into the Rocky Mountains. But after 18 months, they reached the Pacific Ocean.
One of the most significant events during Jefferson's first term was a Supreme Court decision, Marbury versus Madison. This case established the Supreme Court's power of judicial review to declare acts of Congress unconstitutional. In 1804, Jefferson was re-elected. His victory smashed the Federalists. It marked the end of the politics of deference and the beginning of government by the will of the people. But his second term was more difficult and toward the end was dominated by an issue which generated much hostility. It was the Embargo Act, which was passed in 1807 in response to Napoleon's blockade of Britain. The Embargo Act forbade American trading with foreign nations, including Britain and France, America's chief trading partners. For Jefferson, the idea that the United States, through its foreign commerce, through its carrying trade, so important to Europe that by withdrawing it or withholding it, you could exert an influence in European politics. As a result, commerce began to decline. In New England, there were cries to repeal the act. Some accused Jefferson of trying to ruin the economy. The pressure was overwhelming. And just three days before Jefferson retired from office in 1809, the Embargo Act was repealed. Jefferson's second term has been called the anti-climax of his remarkable life. After he left the White House, Jefferson returned to his home at Monticello, away from the political fights he so despised. It wasn't until now that Jefferson considered Monticello finished. Having taken over 40 years to build, it is a remarkable place. Here he read and wrote, and mended his relationship with Adams and pursued other fields of interest agriculture, architecture and botany. And Jefferson was a remarkable inventor. The seven-day clock, for example, which he designed to be operated by cannonballs. He invented double automatic doors, the first inlaid parquet floor, an architect's table, the dumbwaiter which he used to bring wine out of the cellar, and he invented revolving pantry doors. Each room at Monticello bears the unmistakable imprint of Jefferson's eye for beauty and is viewed as the supreme statement of his genius. Jefferson loved to garden and he kept notes about everything he planted. The culture of the earth, he said, was the most delightful of all occupations. He loved the land and all things connected with it. As Jefferson grew old at Monticello, he spoke of his deep-felt concern that slavery would destroy the nation. I considered it at once the death knell of the Union, he wrote. It was an issue he struggled with as a leader, as an individual, and as a slaveholder himself. So he wrote his anti-slavery position out very, very uh, emphatically. He said, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and his justice will not sleep forever. So there was a strong commitment on his part to this. But in his time, slavery was so entrenched, Jefferson felt a truly equal biracial society was impossible. As he neared death, Jefferson's warnings about slavery tearing the country apart were proving prophetic. The roots of the Civil War were already taking form. On July 4th, 1826, on the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson died at Monticello. He was 83. And one of the great coincidences of American history is that 90-year-old John Adams died on the very same day. As the story goes, Jefferson, just before he died, asked, is it the 4th? Only hours later, Adam's last words were, Thomas Jefferson lives. Jefferson wrote his own epitaph. It listed what he considered his three greatest accomplishments. They were author of the Declaration of Independence, creator of the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom, founder of the University of Virginia, 
Jefferson did not want to be remembered simply for his presidency, rather as the man he was, a man whose life was dedicated to human liberty and justice.